Welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium, along with our partners Shareable, the Kresge Foundation and the Barr Foundation. I'm Professor Julian Adjuman, and with my research assistants, Perry Scheinbaum and Caitlin McLennan, we organize Cities at Tufts as a cross-disciplinary academic initiative, which recognizes Tufts University as a leader in urban studies, urban planning, and sustainability issues. And I'd just like to say that this will be uh, Perry Scheinbaum's last, uh, as a second year student, last um, Cities at Tufts. And um, Perry, thank you so much for all the work you've done. and. Caitlin for carrying on uh, into next year. We'd like to acknowledge that Tufts University's Medford campus is located on colonized Wampanoag and Massachusetts traditional territory. Today, we are delighted to welcome Killian Riano. Killian is assistant dean at the Pratt School um, of Architecture in Brooklyn, New York. And in that role, he works across all four schools of the, uh, of the department, all four schools of the departments. Hmm to help uh, develop and amplify the research-driven spatial outcomes with real-world impact. Killian is also the founder and lead designer of DSGN AGNC, I'm assuming that's Design Agency, a design studio exploring new forms of political design, processes and engagements through architecture, urbanism, landscapes and art. Uh, Killian and DSGN AGNC's design work has featured at the Venice Biennale, the Queen's Museum of Art, Harvard University, the Storefront for Art and Architecture, the New Museum, the Center for Architecture and the Architectural League of New York, among others. Uh, Killian has over a decade of teaching experience and is an initiator and core member of Dark Matter University. He holds a bachelor's in design from the University of Florida School of Architecture and a master's of architecture from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Uh, Killian's talk today is Gaming the System, Role-Playing Spatial and Political Change. Killian, a Zoom-tastic welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium. As usual, microphones off and video off and send questions through the chat function. Killian, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Julian. Thanks so much to you, to Tufts, to Shareable for uh, inviting me to have a conversation with all of you. Uh, what I'm hoping to do over the next 20 minutes or so is I, I'm going to chat a little bit about some work and projects that I both have done, have been involved in uh, as part of collectives and some of the ideas of where some of that work might be uh, coming from. Um, and, and also uh, a little bit of, uh, of conversations around how games and performance, etc., have made their way into different uh, aspects of work and how one of my main interests has been that as we uh, think about sharing, collectivizing, uh, creating more, uh, more, more um, uh, co-opportunities, negotiation and conversations about governance, be governance become more and more important. That uh, the, the, the ideas of, of, of co collaboration, co-production, co-anything is not a, a, an end in itself, but it is a process and it's an, a, it's a, it's an invitation for, um, for uh, pro uh, democratic processes. So uh, for me, it, it begins uh, with Augusto Boal. Uh, I left architecture school and I was uh, interested in, in pursuing uh, conversations around politics, but I wasn't sure where to start, quite honestly, my, uh, my education. Uh, although uh, Thoreau had not uh, really chatted about some of these principles. For me, theater of the oppressed was important because it, uh, it gave uh, tools uh, for role playing, for uh, really under trying to understand the systems of oppression and understanding that they're, they're not a one thing that can be solved, but rather a systems of, uh, way of thinking. They, it brought the body into, into the conversation. In my experience, my everyday experience of, of oppression and systems is as important as many others and will allow me to, um, to then uh, think about the systems. And so the body and the system are constantly at play. And it also gave a role for the arts. What is the role of the person kind of uh, the facilitator, the joker, the, the what, what, what other, and, 
and to me has always been helpful. The other work has been Chantal Mouffe and Agonism, a contemporary political theorist that basically has said that democracy has always been intention. It's in one word, liberal, uh, liberal democracy. Liberal is trying to be uh, universalist, etc. Uh, and the other, the, the democracy is trying to like draw a line among who belongs, who is the, who is in the system and who's outside. Uh, and that uh, as it's facing uh, a pluralistic moment, it's having a hard time because that uh, a lot of the foundations of our democratic principles take into account an initial political subject, uh, usually in our case, white men, land owning. Uh, and, and as that has been challenged, our institutions uh, are having a hard time right now dealing with those changes and how can we have a fully pluralistic democracy. These two, th two things have led me to think again about how the idea of games, and what I mean here games is it's just I'm trying to find a word uh, around kind of how to talk about negotiation, how to talk about performance, and by performance I mean literally being in a room working with other people, and, uh, 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 and, and at that time it can be, be performative, it can be similar to the theater of the oppressed, role playing or something like that, or the very thing that we're doing, the, the negotiations and governances as a kind of performance. Uh, and, and I, you know, at, at times I have gone away from the word games, I come back to it because it, it can be misunderstood that it's about, you know, uh, playfully playing ping pong <laughs> at the office or something. And that's not what I mean. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing some of the, the, the work. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to start with the Architecture Lobby. It's an organization, a collective that I was a part of for many years. I have uh, taken a step back, but it is something, it is work that I did uh, for uh, close to 10 years. That's very close to my heart. And uh, so with Peggy Deemer, the founder, and the great uh, national and international teams that have uh, come to organize uh, under that organization. It's been, um, uh, for anyone that doesn't know the architecture lobby, it's, it's, uh, it's an organization that really uh, advocates for architects as workers that is trying to bring conversations around labor into the larger architectural community. Uh, I, I wanted to begin because uh, performance in this case, like performing uh, protest has been an important part of the lobby from the beginning. Uh, making, having, going to the AIA Chicago convention, I think it was 2012 to 10 years ago, and uh, showing that we are uh, um, uh, precarious workers. And, and uh, you know, uh, we brought the, the, the um, it, we, that as, as a way of working. And then that idea of performance of theater of the oppressed being used as a way to think about our everyday experience within labor. Uh, so during the Chicago Biennial, and I honestly forgot how many years ago, uh, we put together um, with a great team of, of people, uh, many, many people working on scripts, working, bringing their own experiences to create scenes, one per each of the manifesto points, and to go through the, the, that idea of trying to understand the systematic nature of, uh, of how labor uh, affects us, uh, and how, what kind of organizations, what kind of structures, what kind of solidarities do we need to be able to change some of those conditions? Again, staying away from solutionist approaches. Uh, but rather creating uh, bodies of solidarity. Uh, I, it's on YouTube, it's called Re There's Reworking Architecture, and I'm gonna invite you all to take a look at that. I won't post the link because then you won't pay attention to me anymore, uh, but I will invite you to that. Um, then the same group, uh, I think that it has two broad, large, uh, large uh, efforts. One is around unionization and, and conversations around how to bring unions into architecture. The other one around cooperation, cooperative networks, understanding that a lot of architects are also kind of small practitioners, etc. Uh, how a, a group of us, as you can see here, Gabriel Sierra, uh, Peggy Deemer, Ashton Ham, uh, James Hurd, Will Martin, my 
itself, Shaheen uh, Ribari and Christian Rutherford wrote uh, uh, the research and wrote pieces on how to begin to bring those small practices together uh, into a cooperative network that both would allow those firms and, uh, and, and small practitioners to share resources, but also then to um, to begin to participate in the larger network of cooperatives and collectives that uh, can affect uh, com uh, communities. So we're looking at also partner how do how does how would this work also partnering with people already working and doing this kind of work. So that's a little bit on the architecture lobby and here and out of that what I wanted to share is that idea that starting with with performance moving to that kind of almost uh, a, a theater of the oppressed like uh, image theater is uh, sections in which things are identified then i identify and beginning to create collectivities out of that uh, then i'm gonna chat a little bit about a couple other projects and things uh, my first experience with co collectives was who owns space it was a conversation around uh, the the increasing of pri uh, pri uh, privatization of public space in our cities and what that could mean uh, this one was a collective with artists, urban planners, lawyers, and we did everything from creating these kind of vignettes about the way that uh, public space rules were being broken to tours of privately owned public spaces. And this work led uh, to a, a, a commission work with the Queens Museum of Art, now just the Queens Museum in Corona. My background right now is Corona Plaza in the neighborhood of North Corona in Queens, a heavily immigrant neighborhood and mostly Latinx, um, um, Mexican-American, uh, Ecuadorian-American, Dominican-American, Colombian-American, uh, and, uh, and a, a new plaza was going in here. And the conversation was about how to uh, create a process for a new kind of uh, sharing of, of space and, and new engagement, sorry. Uh, one of the things that I share with the Queens Museum is that I didn't really want to design the plaza, that, that I didn't see that as the, 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 the project here, but more about designing the pro engagement processes that would have conversations that would leave even behind uh, groups of people that can advocate and have conversations around how public space is used. And so uh, I created, the, we started with this, uh, the, the design agency team and I created this series of, uh, of signs. Uh, we call them lo-fi augmented reality um, that allowed people to see the plaza in different ways through plexiglass, uh, allow us to have conversations going back to the, the themes around privatization, public and uses in Spanish and English. And then out of that, we identified uh, five major items that people were talking about, uh, social services, green spaces, mobility, local economies, and community programming. Uh, we decided to turn this, and, and at the time, I was actually also teaching and working in Medellin, Colombia, with an actual theater of the oppressed group that had been doing urban planning. And so the, these questions were on my mind. Well, we decided to create a game, uh, a negotiation game. Uh, each of these five items got three uh, pieces, and uh, so 15 total, and, uh, and we created a 12 uh, piece board. Um, the, and then through prompts, uh, the idea was to get people to, to have conversations. It was a game without a winner or loser or no real, no real aim except to have the conversation itself. So we, this, this is what that looked like. This is the, the plaza uh, one winter, uh, I think in 2011 and 2012. Um, and people stood for hours in the snow playing the game, uh, talking about what, it, you know, with each move, talking about what that meant, you know, uh, the fear of people, uh, for what would happen to, to the Tamala lady that stands there the fear of more banks and more um, uh, cell phone stores coming in and, and replacing the kind of um, the kind of retail activities that actually give uh, a, a lot of the immigrants here their first jobs, et cetera. And then we gave the, the Queens Museum, the Department of Transportation, a series of notes from these meetings. Um, but then I, I, I kept wondering, similarly to probably uh, on public space conversation about the, the systems by which these public spaces are, are um, 
uh, maintain, managed, and uh, and both what they could mean uh, for this conversation between privatization, public goods, etc. And one of the things that was happening, well, right after I finished my my project with the Queen's Museum, is that um, the man the 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 people that were managing the plaza as per the plaza program uh, tools decided to no longer do that. So in order to maintain the plaza, uh, a large business improvement district was, um, was proposed uh, in Jackson Heights. And it was to expand the, 180, the existing 182nd Street, Little Columbia Way. And, and, uh, and I was interested in looking at a piece of policy as a design thing, understanding that you know that is it's a complex piece of policy and that it has both social and spatial outcomes uh, and to, to find its history the way it has been used and the potentials for a community like this and <clears throat> so i put together a studio called urban embodiments uh, at parsons in the masters of design and urban ecologies a great group of students uh, uh, that worked on this. Um, we started by doing a research into three major themes, the social infrastructures, meaning that the physical spaces, the political economies, things like business and improvement districts and other rules that govern that, those, that infrastructure. And then the communal processes, how people's everyday experiences both shape and are shaped by the two, the political economies and the, the social infrastructures. And out of that and doing the research, uh, four teams were reconfigured and created. I'm gonna show you the work from two of the teams, uh, the negotiating space for negotiation and the uh, Linea Siete um, agenda engine. Um, the, the, the negotiating space for negotiation, it, it seems more, <laughs> I'm sorry, it keeps going back and forth. Seems more uh, important today than even did back then. And that because of COVID, there's a lot more uh, happening in front of businesses and, uh, and the street eateries. These students use the beginnings of those rules, the street seat uh, rules that the Department of Transportation had in order to create a, a political economy that would be new, that would be basically by using this uh, as an excuse to create an, a new uh, micro political units of tenants, uh, street vendors, uh, uh, people, um, uh, other kinds of businesses that were in large businesses uh, to maintain and create something similar to a, what, what a business improvement district does. And for people that don't know, a business improvement district does basically three things. Creates a, a, a uniform signage or some sort of identity for an area. It picks up trash more often than the city will and creates a sense of security, whether that's through things like cameras or security guards. And in the research, we found that if, you know, you have to buy into that these things are all good, but they, they that business improvement districts are generally successful in doing those three things. But the questions are, are those three things good? <laughs> And, and the question is how democratic it is, because what happens is that uh, a nonprofit um, after with a the, with the board um, uh, with some of the people that are taxed through here, some of the la larger uh, landowners especially, can dictate things in public space uh, in ways that, uh, that, that mean that other, that cannot be done in otherwise. And so <clears throat> the existing uh, bid here, doesn't didn't allow for uh, at the time when we were doing this research street vending and uh, and there was a lot of concern that the expanded business improvement district wouldn't do it wouldn't allow that either uh, so that's an example of, of so if if it does those three things how uh, the, the these students questions what how can we do that in a different more collective way uh, the second group, uh, an agenda, uh, the Linea Siete agenda engine, basically took a, a page from the original Monopoly <laughs> and allowed people to play the way a business improvement district, what it is, how, how it works, uh, uh, and then uh, as, uh, as it exists now, uh, with the relative power dynamics of the place. So they created personas from everything from uh, land, uh, large landowners, developers to street vendors. And then they would play it once 
the way that a bid works and began to see what those dynamics would be. And then we played one other uh, one more time, uh, trying to reimagine uh, how to do the same things that a business improvement district would do in other ways. Uh, so this is what the students created. This is a group of um, um, uh, uh, street vendors working on this project um, uh, and, and basically going through the, the playing the game. <laughs> Another group of students from uh -oh, what's happening here. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm having a little bit of uh, <laughs> I'm seeing some odd things where uh, um, uh, when after I don't see everything that uh, anyway. I'll move on. <laughs> a group, uh, I brought a group of students from County University in Ottawa to actually work in Queens out of the, uh, the Queens Pride House. Uh, and in a group without me sharing the previous team's uh, game, decided to create a game. In this case, the game will be, will be to create a spatial dynamics. Uh, putting in, bringing in politics. So for example, if the councilwoman was supporting you, what would you be able to do if you were working with one of the major nonprofits? If so, play, uh, uh, kind of creating a scenario of, uh, of constituency and, and, and political bodies buildings in order to shape and reshape space. Uh, I'm putting some of the players, for example, there's a school nearby, How, what can be done uh, to shift space for those children, uh, that kind of question. Uh, so yeah, so that's the Corona work. <laughs> Again, it began with who owns space, questioning public space, then moving into an actual space with uh, an immigrant community and, and really uh, working on, on negotiations and having conversations and then shifting to what that means at a larger urban scale and looking at uh, policies like the business improvement district as, um, as a more specific kind of sort of design that the, the policies themselves are designed to have specific outcomes and then they, they lead to uh, social and spatial outcomes. Uh, the last thing I'll say about bids is that for anyone that might not know them, one of the things that I found most interesting is that basically it was a way to compete with malls. So in one of this, uh, they started in Toronto, uh, and one of the, as White Fly took uh, hold of cities, and uh, it was basically a way to make people feel in cities more like they would feel in a mall, uh, something I've always found kind of interesting. Uh, so I'm going to share a couple other ways in which then games have been used. This is a, a, a project, a small little project that I made uh, for Dallas. It was a, for an arts conference about the future of the southwestern city. Uh, it's one of those in which they give you almost no money and, 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 uh, and they want you to build a little pavilion, something for this uh, arts conf uh, conference. So what, uh, what I decided to create was a, a quick and easily kind of manufactured and, and placed a sandbox uh, in which the children or anyone that uses it would uh, negotiate land and water. <laughs> so all these uh, yellow wooden sticks here, uh, you can actually go into the sandbox and, and uh, either create your own little corner of it or you can share more of space and the more space you share then uh, this do catcher in the back would you you could use more of the water so it was a, a hopefully a fun way to think about the, the kind of resources and that kind of dynamic around sharing and negotiation another one was in nicaragua where uh, in a collaboration with studio teddy cruz um uh, landscape artist simon boussier and the studios he was teaching at ball state university and also this started as a as a harvard graduate studio um, uh, so uh, using all this to think about how to develop a housing project in Nicaragua in a site that did not have a great survey. So we didn't know where the trees are, where we had to have a, 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 a light touch and also create opportunities here for, for there not to be a master plan, but rather what we created was something that I would call a set of rules. I, I, again, a game-like, set of rules that people on the ground can interpret can uh, and all around using the trees so uh, it began by identifying where the trees are uh, identifying a middle zone for things like infrastructure water for pathways uh, and then allowing where the trees are to be in the the main reason why you would move 
uh, and where you would place the house. The house itself then rethought also as a, as a um, from what was being built, which was kind of these uh, CMU boxes um, into more open uh, structures that would allow more light and air to come in and would also allow the house to grow over time. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna go into a couple of, of into another quick, and I promise I'll do this. You know what? I, I, I'm, I kind of don't really have much time left. So I'm going to skip some of this and go straight to um, uh, the conversation around dark matter university. Uh, the important thing here to know is that I, I, I was in Ohio uh, doing work and research around cooperatives, collectives, very interesting things like the Evergreen Cooperatives. Cleveland owns a community driven, uh, uh, mostly led by people of color uh, group that was creating new models of, of uh, own, collective ownership and, and spatial creation through that. Um, and then it, uh, after the murder of George Floyd uh, and as the pandemic was beginning, uh, uh, the, the conversations uh, as they began to hit architecture made a group of, uh, of us, uh, BIPOC uh, design educators, uh, talk about some of the things that our own fields needed to start doing. Uh, so we came together and, and a group of us about, I think the numbers anywhere between 12 to 20 something, um, uh, created Dark Matter University, a BIPOC-led uh, uh, collective that is trying to reimagine uh, education is democratic in nature. And what we're trying to create is new forms of knowledge and knowledge protection, new forms of institutions and power, collectivity and practice, community and culture, as well as new forms of design. It started with Tuskegee University, five of us teaching a course, uh, Justin Garen Moore, uh, <clears throat> Jennifer Newsom, Jer uh, uh, Jerome Hafford, Vanessa Alicia Chuki, and myself. Uh, working with incoming uh, undergraduate students, and it was great sharing basically our paths. And all of us both have many things in common, but we also have slightly different paths uh, that we've taken in within the design world. Great, we created a constellation of, of uh, courses, both allied and taught. So uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit of the one of the first studios. It, this was uh, that, that was taught as part of Dark Matter University be, be, between a landscape architect Jen Lo and myself. Uh, it was called Cooperative Futures, and and the studio was done as uh, again the idea of Dark Matter University was to allow institutions to reimagine even how they uh, how how classes are taught. So in this case, it was a relationship between Kent State University. Uh, <clears throat> Carleton University in Ottawa, again, <laughs> different group of people. It actually was interesting. Uh, uh, Jalisa Bloomberg and Curry Hackett, who taught uh, another allied uh, 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 studio, mini studio called For With, an individual practice towards collective expression uh, that, uh, that was really incredible looking at uh, African-American arts, culture, expressions, and finding urbanisms and, and spatial outcomes out of that. And then the studio we had, which was more around how to, uh, uh, if all these things are already happening in Northeast Ohio, what, what is the spatial expression of collectivity in, in some ways, some experiments around that, and I'll share that. Um, and some of the community, I'm sorry, community partners are where Cleveland owns, Third Space Action Lab, 12 Literary Arts, and even the Community Development Corporation of Midtown participated. It was a great, so what it allows us is to create, have a constellation of two studios happening at Kent State and uh, Ottawa and Carleton uh, uh, with the same theme, then two studios within Carleton, then a group of community partners all working with us together. It was really a, a, a fun experience. We're looking at the community of Huff that sits between Cleveland, uh, downtown Cleveland and the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western University. So two enclaves with incredible wealth in Northeast Ohio uh, with community, mostly African-American communities in the middle that had been redlined and systematically disinvested on for decades. Uh, <clears throat> So what we did with, with Jen is create a system and, and the Kent State Studio, I was teaching by myself, but use the same systems 
in which it would allow us to look at the folks already making change in the ground, all of them interested in collectivity in one way or another, and uh, begin to design for people on the ground with the body. So taking that idea, it, then uh, they would move to bodies, so to, to design for two or three bodies, then to begin to aggregate that into maybe a building, a landscape, or a big chunk of, or a chunk of urbanism, and then into an urban context. So body, bodies, aggregations, and connections. Uh, and then at each stage, the students had to negotiate with other groups. We created, I forget if it was four or five groups. Uh, so for example, at the body stage, let's say, I, I was designing a, almost a piece of furniture and um, a spatial piece of furniture for one person. I would have to talk to another group that had done the same project, talk about and think about the person they were doing it or the, the kind of uh, agglomeration, the, the kind of persona that, that they had been building for. And I had to consider what they had been doing, the, the, the person's story, the spatial idea and incorporate and make changes uh, mutations so you would make, you would negotiate, you, you, you would mutate your, your, your body scale piece, and then you would scale up to the next, uh, uh, the next scale with the, uh, the mutation in mind. What that led to is that everyone's product, we were working collectively and everyone was working almost with ideas and, and, and thoughts from every other group, but you were still working on your project. So it was a way to create, to almost, make visible some of the, the themes you may have seen up to now around negotiation, mutation, uh, bodies and uh, political bodies, everything from this scale to larger scales and that those, the, 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 the back and forth between those bodies. So what that led to was some interesting uh, work. For example, this uh, group here uh, looked at the 12 literary arts um, and uh, and it, it's a group that within uh, Huff and, and the surrounding communities that brings uh, writers uh, into in, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, I'm, I'm going to say fellowships, residencies, residencies. So uh, how would their needs match, for example, the needs of children in the community and design spaces for housing for the community, residencies and play all at the same time? So beginning to create almost hybrid structures that are very kind of grounded on what's already happening and begin to provide more. In one of my potentially favorite cases of this group, it was really taken by the story of Lexi Latimer, a ballet dancer who's also a community, um, those community driven processes and was doing working for urban design, urban planning processes. And they, they were taken by her process that includes performance and includes dance, uh, not the only thing, but it does include that, to begin to think about uh, uh, what the work she was doing with the, the especially young people in that community. And Minette uh, Murphy and Thompson uh, Gwyn uh, created what they called the Pink Tutu, uh, a series of spatial strategies that, would, that could be applied by the communities themselves, tested out, and if they proved to be, uh, um, uh, something that people want, then amplified on. Uh, they used the, the space uh, by uh, uh, from uh, uh, that Adam Drew King, a uh, local technologist, and, and that he's also part of Cleveland owns. Uh, he has he owns a series of public spaces in this area, uh, and they also were interested in working with someone like Mansfield Fraser, a gentleman that sadly passed away about a year ago who owns a vineyard in, in Huff. So he's literally growing grapes and wines in this community. Uh, as well as looking at the smaller space, so not only for newer spaces, but existing spaces to amplify the connections and community relationships of today. With that, I'm going to end, uh, and, and there's always more, and I left a lot on the table, but uh, that was that's all the time I have, and, and I wanna get into some conversations. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Killian. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, presentation on so many levels. Um, you know, we don't get to engage as urban planning, environmental policy and planning people, perhaps as much as we would like to with, uh, with, with architects. And so your world and our world, of course, are very close, but maybe we, we should explore the 
the places in between a little bit more. Can I start? We've got several questions, but can I start? You use the word space probably more than you did the word place. To, to an architect like yourself, how do you differentiate place and space? Interesting question, Julian. Uh, yeah, uh, and, it, and, and I think that shows my training. Uh, for me, uh, you know, it's funny because it's the first time that has ever been asked <laughs> of me. <laughs> and given the kind of work and the kind of uh, places where I present it actually is a little bit odd that it has never been asked before. Uh, and I and but as I think about it, what it allow, uh, I, I feel like I use the words basically interchangeably. Maybe uh, uh, it's a way to both understand that the kind of um, the built environment uh, uh, it, it shapes and is shaped by people. Uh, that is the the heart of what I use at the end of the day, spatial as. Um, but perhaps my education and being being asked at every review, where's the space in this? Has has uh, has invaded my my language. And uh, but really, what I mean when I say that is how the built environment is shaped and how that shapes both uh, communities and policies. And and, the, and really, at the end of the day, what I'm interested in is the inner interaction between those three things. Okay, thank you. And. I think segueing from that, Roberto Morales Roman asks, uh, what do you call this practice in Spanish? Interesting question as well. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if you're asking me literally to translate it. Uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna, the, the disclosure is that I, my Spanish is good enough to like chat. I, I'm Colombian. I was born in Bogota, Colombia, grew up in Miami, have lived all over the US, including New Mexico, South Dakota, Boston, New York for a long time, Cleveland. Um, so, but the, so I actually am not a hundred percent sure how to call in this. I can share this with you. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting question in the Roberto in that, uh, uh, this, and you probably know this given what I see of your, your flag here, uh, is that there are many collectivos, uh, that, that are uh, happening everywhere from Chile to Puerto Rico, you know, uh, uh, I've known some of them in, in Venice. Uh, I, I was doing a project one time around immigration in Venice and, and a, collect, a collectivo from Puerto Rico came out. Uh, the practice I'm not sure has a, a, a name in itself because, I, but it is interesting that it is typically a mixture and as is mine, uh, I am maybe a North American version of this. I'm obviously not the only one, but uh, I, I never, I even don't know what to call it my own practice that is between arts, architecture, urbanism, and just whatever. And even the language that I use when I go into communities changes. If I feel like calling myself an artist opens up certain opportunities, I do that. <laughs> if, I, if I find that the, the, my training as an architect is helpful to mention, or if my uh, interest and experience and teaching career in urbanism is, is uh, important. So, uh, what I find that the, these practices are care a little bit less about the name, and I have studied them both in Europe, Latin America, and North America. North America tends to be a little bit harder, just because collectivity in North America tends to be a little bit harder to pull off. Everything from uh, student debt to uh, prices to the way nonprofit uh, uh, things work in tenure. <laughs> Oh, uh, there are many systems that actually uh, try to uh, enforce uh, uh, individuality versus collectivity. And, um, uh, but in, in the places that I have studied, uh, uh, and in the, I'm also a little bit in Southeast Asia, in East Asia, found a little bit less, but I'm sure they exist and I'm just not aware. Um, and as well in Africa, and I do know a couple of collectives. But in everywhere, I think that people just use the word collect, collectivos, collectives, and, and they are trying to maybe focus on the larger issues about uh, being maybe change agents and less on, on kind of describing what they do and they just use whatever tools they have, they work with the local communities, et cetera. Roberto, do you have any, yeah, would you like to follow up on that? Thank you, just that. So, cause I, I would love to, like as a as a sort of gamification of of engagement, you know that that um, that way of doing it. You know, I've I've 
I've heard of it before. I've seen an example uh, when I was, you know, doing my planning masters, um, and I would love to look into it more because I've, I've, you know, I've seen that it's it's very successful in getting people to understand difficult concepts and to and to participate, right? Um, so even if you know, kind of the the what would I Google? <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, in, for me, honestly, even, I was just wondering if they're, you know. I'm going to share with you what I've done, which is I would look at Theater of the Oppressed, uh, I, because I think that what Theater of the Oppressed does that other gaming platforms uh, uh, doesn't is that doesn't leave politics behind, doesn't leave, leave systems behind. It was created sp specifically to decolonize, decolonize before that was even a word or a, 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 a a little bit of what has become a buzzword at this point. Uh, uh, and and I, I think that perhaps looking at an, uh, what I, analogous research, uh, the places, other places that are doing it. And again, I would say that performance might be a good place. There's also things like serious games. Uh, I know they, even the UN and other people use that word, you, uh, the idea of serious games as a way of doing it. Um, but but for me, I I found it more productive for me personally to go through that lens, not calling myself a performer, but rather invite people that do it, learn from, and work with. Hmm. Are you an animateur, Killian? What does that mean? Animate? Are you an animator? Um, I, I saw somewhere in uh, Toronto that the city council at some stage about 10 or 15 years ago employed uh, some people as community animators uh, uh, and I like that concept people who animate because I mean animation performance um, yeah yeah no now that you mention it yeah now it, it, it sounds similar to what happened in Bogota <laughs> yeah where even at times like um uh, the famous thing of clowns to make fun of your driving, that kind of thing. But I'm, uh, I'm I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, uh, I, I haven't really ever thought about it quite that way. Uh, uh, I mostly feel like uh, I, I, my practice has been about uh, asking uh, questions on and and. Yeah, I don't know. I, and I'm going to share this with you. This is one quick thought and may, it may or may not answer the, the question as uh, I, I feel like the, what I, I have tried to do is that uh, as you come in and you see what's the, dyna the dynamics that are happening in working class communities that are usually in the US, that ends up meaning uh, communities of color, immigrant communities, etc. Um, that there's always this idea that change is inevitable, right? That change is just going to come. So for me, the question has been one about a que asking, okay, change, it, I as an immigrant, I'm changing to a system, right? I, have, I agree that it's good. Yet the agency to change, uh, for change uh, is not uh, equal across the board. Uh, the way that the Upper East Side changes is very different than the way that bed -Stuy changes, right? Uh, so what are the reasons for that? Uh, what are the policies? What are the, and, and then uh, trying to create structures by which some of that change can be uh, more uh, driven by the communities that, uh, that are affected by it. Not, not to stop it, not to anything, but rather to, uh, to ask the questions that would allow those, those groups to be uh, in the driver's seat. Uh, or at least something like that, and not to say that we've been successful, et cetera, but that is the question. Great, thank you. We've got a question from uh, Shadia Garrison. Uh, what do you think are the benefits of incorporating play into our fields and generally uh, into our lives? And fields, I think that means professional fields. Yes. Is that right, Shadia? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. I think it's very important. I think both um, play can do a couple of things. It can sometimes hide more serious conversations, right? It can bring them up and make them less threatening. <laughs> so when, when you're talking about someone, so 
I think it's very important. But again, I think it's important to uh, to not forget that as you do that, to then bring the, the larger questions, the politics, the, the, the real kind of conversations behind. When it becomes play for play's sake, um, I sometimes wonder if it then becomes a tool uh, for, for you know, like uh, to soften um, uh, that that change that that that, that maybe uncontrollable change. So, what happens when uh, when uh, let's someone that wants to change a community put uh, luxury condos and that's going to displace a whole bunch of people when they begin to uh, put out the big chess play uh, chess games and and, and the, the things that look fun and kind of informal etc they th that is a ways of using play and and the way that um sometimes in in now in labor you see it too the ping pong tables etc yes in one way there can be great ways to br bring wellness another way is to like disguise that that the blurring of work and life it can end up becoming a labor issue right so uh, I just want to complicate the idea of play, not to make it seem like it's an end on it in itself, but rather that play might allow both to uh, be able to uh, bring people along. It, it, it also bring young people along, which I think is incredibly important. <laughs> and I think often like providing things that look that are playful will bring often young people and their parents. <laughs> And, and in that you might have uh, be able to have a, a, a bigger conversation than you would have otherwise. Uh, the last thing I mentioned around play is that play brings the possibility of something uh, potentially um, unusual, weird, like that, that, that game in, in Corona, that by the, the very kind of, I don't know, like in, I don't think everyone knew exactly what to make of it, but that allowed them to open up possibilities and, and conversations that are, were not typical. Great, thanks. I'm just thinking about, you know, the words play, performance. Um, these, uh, these are words that, you know, progressive architects are using a lot. And uh, are we using them enough, I wonder, in, uh, in urban planning? The, you know, the, the pursuit of joy through play and performance, the sidewalk ballet. We've had all of these ideas. I wonder how much we are really uh, adopting those into sort of planning policy and practice. That's just a, that's just me musing. Yeah. Uh, Shadia, any, any follow up on play? I know this is one of your interests. No, we're good, thank you. Okay. I wanna um, ask a couple of questions about Dark Matter University. I mean, Killian, this is where you and I sort of came together and I just think it's a fantastic concept. Can you tell us a little bit more about the potential for growth of this, this idea? Because, you know, if you think about it, you know, I thought Dark Matter University, where is it? Where is it located? And of course it isn't located. It is a, a very fluid um, idea. Well, what's the vision amongst the organizing group for where this goes? Uh, so um, thank you so much for asking about it because it's a, a, a group, a space, um, again, space, but um, a, a community that I'm very proud to be a part of. Um, uh, I think that when we started, uh, in a funny way, we started and we moved very quickly within months of like coming together as, and giving it a name. Uh, we were already kind of in that first course in Tuskegee. A few months later, we had multiple courses in multiple places. Beyond the studio, one of the great things that has been collectively uh, created is a design justice fundamentals course that has been taught in multiple schools. And usually, uh, if not always, we ask that um, the collective ask that is taught at two places at the same time together. So we had Utah and Florida A&M uh, and all those students would come together uh, virtually uh, to, to have that conversation and to work. So uh, that led to some great experiments both within DMU, allied to DMU, slightly out of it, but still part of it uh, between uh, like uh, Jerome Haffer and Curry Hackett uh, teaching uh, maybe at Howard and, and Yale or different, different things like that. Things that now have shifted policies at, at those schools. And so that happened very kind of quickly and there was lots of energy. 
the reality is that both some of that can continue. And, and one of the advantages for us was that virtual teaching and that moment uh, really allowed us to be very flexible and to do some of these things and to, to, to do it well. Now, as, as schools are beginning to go more and more in person, the, the question is going to be how much of this we can continue and uh, how much we can amplify on. Uh, the question on the table for us always is going to be how much do we work within inst the existing institutions? How much do we create new ones uh, so that we create our own summer school, our own kind of... Uh, so there, the, right now, uh, and as well, I mean, something that personally for me is important and that, that we also talk about is how to respond that after we started this, multiple places have made even some of, the, some of this kind of education illegal <laughs> or very close to illegal. Uh, and what is our responsibility within that? And, and then how can, can we work with other, within our collective or with other collectives to respond to things like that? So the, the future, I think, is going to be uh, and one of the, the beautiful things about it is that it's flexible, that there's so many of us that we have different ideas and, and uh, you know, performance uh, also brings some interesting concepts. Like, for example, in the architecture lobby, very early on, we started using the both and. So bringing in kind of improv language into our community organizing uh, of our community. Not, community but uh, in this one we, you know like in a way we, the, the designers protest group I love they, they have this idea around a bias towards action um, and that there's enough people and enough things going on that we can have multiple things and experiments going and some of the things will continue some of them will not uh, there was a course that was taught by a, a group of folks uh, uh, with Van Allen uh, working with co community members from NYCHA and that has led to spins, uh, to, that has spinned into other courses and into other ways of working. So uh, for us, I think that the, the, the future is about uh, amplifying and kind of sharpening the, the, those are the things that we've already done. And uh, looking at possibilities as also with other groups outside of academia, how to bring that all also and to work more closely with folks affected with these changes. And then uh, that larger question on what to do as um, the potentially uh, the national uh, environment gets uh, uh, hostile towards these ideas. Yeah, and, and just being aware of the time and uh, looking for a, a kind of uh, last question. Um, you mentioned, you know, institutions, and uh, we desperately, we're, we're, I think all of our universities are looking at the institution uh, itself in the light of all of the, uh, the conflicts that we're facing, certainly here in the US. And I'm thinking, do you only work with like-minded institutions? Uh, you get requested to come into certainly like-minded, but what if you were, what if Brigham Young University asked you to, uh, to do some work with them? I mean, you know, there are, I can think of certain institutions that are more needy of your work but that you're not as likely to be invited into them. What's your sort of uh, strategy in, in terms of working cr uh, across conflict, if you like? Um, I could imagine some places, yes, would not like the messages that you're bringing, but would you still work in those institutions? Uh, I mean, in, in that is, that is the kind of thing that really is a collective question. Um, I think that the, any institution would have to be willing to work with us and that at times um, uh, it's good for the collective to push back on an institution and, all, and at times change the way it works. Again, not all institutions want to work in that collective way that we've been asking the two institutions to work together, maybe share faculty, uh, share resources. Uh, yet when they do, they, they really... Um, um, uh, in, they've really enjoyed it. Um, I, I personally would agree with you, Julian, that I think that at times what we need to do is we need to go to the place, this is the way I see it. Uh, as you can see, my work has been inside, it's similarly to DMU's inside and outside institutions. At times I've literally, you know, been in the, in the very activist edge of it where, you know, I've sued government agencies and I work within it. I work within a government agency because 
Uh, and the question is both um, for me is how to create uh, affect the systems that are going to affect most people. Uh, and those tend to be existing institutions, uh, often state schools, often uh, not in places that may not be welcome to uh, or welcome. So for me personally, is it is important that we are we have these conversations that we are uh, and that we are going there. Uh, the idea of but then um, what I think cannot happen is for us to compromise. Uh, uh, the kind of work and and uh, because it's already compromised. It's basically, it's the status quo, right? Like people are not willing to talk about race and 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 uh, the built environment. Uh, people are not uh, willing to talk about these subjectivities, new models uh, of connectivity, etc. Uh, so that's just the status quo. And to come in to do a status quo that would be difficult uh, for for uh, this kind of organization. So, but yeah, I, I think the larger question and the one that I think is really interesting for all the organizing I have done for all the tools is that uh, I think in this moment, especially, it's important to hold uh, institutions accountable, to change them where we can, because similarly to where I began with, uh, with uh, Chantal Mouffe and these conversations about our government being the biggest institution we're a part of, uh, but it has that, that subjectivity, right? Like that, what we've come to, I personally have come to call and now DMU, I think folks, some of you folks use as well, they imply subjectivity of architecture school, of planning school, of all these things uh, is the same, the same, uh, I see a similar process as large democracies. It, it was created for a small group of people it has expanded. It's not. No, it doesn't really know how to respond to it. Uh, yet it's important that it uh, that something happens because if not, those spaces are not going to change, and they're not going to be welcoming the people and the ideas and the ways of thinking that would bring about further change. Uh, and and the changes right here. I mean, the the demographic shifts. The the. the they're here, they, they've been here in many cases forever, right? Like there's always been people of color in the US, it's not something new. Uh, how, uh, however, the demand for a pluralistic democracy is something that is getting, that is uh, 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 more contemporary. And the way that we're describing it, that mean, pluralistic means it doesn't mean that you become like this, like doesn't mean that people come in and, and begin to fit the subjectivity that the institution demands of them, but rather that the institution can accommodate multiple overlapping, at times, hopefully productively conflicting subjectivities. Gillian, on that, I've got plenty more questions, but um, thank you for bringing such uh, thoughtfulness to our final um, Cities at Tufts virtual colloquium for this uh, spring semester. Can we give uh, a round of uh, UEP applause to Killian, please? Thank, Thank you all so much. much. Yeah, uh, stay tuned for next semester's um, uh, Cities at Tufts. Uh, but for this semester, thank you. Thank you for your support. Shareable, the Kresge Foundation, the Bar Foundation, to uh, Perry and Caitlin and Perry. Uh, happy ventures uh, after Tufts. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.